uh, I want to thank uh, Chris Seaton, correct? And his uh, wife Ruby, correct? Uh, for attending. And uh, this this guy is a commercial broker. He's got his own commercial brokerage in, in uh, Toronto. He's the president of the uh, Durham Region Landlord Association. He's written books, authored books on landlording in Ontario. God knows what he's talking about. He's one of the best um, marketers that I've seen in multi-residential and investment properties. Um, he's, a, he's a credibility to his profession. He shares his knowledge. He doesn't keep it to himself. That's a wonderful thing in itself because he's quite secure in who he is. And this, as we all know, um, uh, at least on the commercial side, it's all about relationship. So I, I want to thank Chris for coming. Uh, it's a privilege to have you here. Thanks for the invite. Oh, uh, thank you. And and a side note, we were chatting earlier before, just when Chris came. John Bowes, who owned, uh, uh, what's, what's it called? Uh, uh, the Point? Uh, what's, what was the name of your? Sandy Point. Sandy, Sandy Point. 1,400 acre development. <laughs> uh, it's okay if I tell what you sold it for, John? Yeah, it was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. John sold it for a million bucks. Chris had it listed for a while and brought offers in at like seven and a half million. And so John is thinking silently. I should have kept that thing. I should have kept that thing. And uh, again, Chris knows what he's doing. I'm going to turn it over to you, Chris. You take your liberty here. Um, I'm hoping it's going to be interactive. We've got some large property owners in this room. Uh, uh, some, uh, where's Andy? Where's Andy? Where's he's Andy go? And, oh, he's right there. I'm going to tell you what, this guy knows what he's doing. There's a bunch of polish, there's a lot of property of stock, there's a lot of property owners here. Okay. And so uh, help us take your liberty. All righty. Well, thank you for the first seat. I said, uh, I am a broker of record, but that's not why I'm here. I'm going to talk to you as a landlord, not as a realtor. Right? And I need to remind you, I'm not a lawyer. All right? So you can ask any question you want, I'll answer it to the best of my ability. You can ask interactively. If I don't know, I'll tell you that I don't know about trying to find out the answer for you. Chris, can no. you turn the volume up just a bit for the folks back here? I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, this presentation is usually two hours long, so I can't go through all 78 clauses. So I've highlighted the ones that I think are the most important. Most important? Yeah. And uh, if you see something that you want me to expand on, just tell me. Now, last year in uh, April 2018, the government, the wind government said, no longer can you write your own lease. You must use the standard lease. It's 14 pages long, seven pages are the lease, six pages are free legal advice for tenants, essentially. I'd say it's 90-10. And um, <coughs> section 15 of the lease says that if you have any extra clauses that you want to add, in case we missed anything, we being the government missed anything, then you can add them here. So as you know, I've added 78 which tells you what I think is uh, missing from this and what I think of it, in fact. You can't use your rear form 400. All, it won't all look like this. There'll be, there'll be big letters. It's just uh, this first part, okay? Um, you cannot use the rear 400 anymore. Orea didn't tell anybody, but they went and changed clause 12 and 13. That basically says any terms that you agree to with your landlord that need to go into the lease must be transferred from your 400 into the lease. All right? So you could use it for that purpose. You can still define your relationship with your client in that way, but you can't use those terms. So you can't use your rear 400 as a document for defense in the landlord and tenant board. The only thing you can use now is this standard lease agreement. We're speaking residential leases, right? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, this is residential tenancies only. Uh, commercial doesn't have any of this stuff. All right. The standard lease is my number two defense against bad tenants and bad tenant behavior. My number one defense 
is qualified, qualified, oh, wait a minute, qualified. All right? So, and I have a 22 point qualification process that I go through. And I have, you know, on more than one occasion, even though vacancy rates are the lowest they've been in living memory, I've actually had a unit or two that I've kept vacant for more than a month, sometimes two months. I get on average 40 inquiries, maybe five or six applications, and I've had times where I've not accepted any, rather than go through the, you know what LTV stands for, right? Landlords to blame. Oh. Listen, yeah, the uh, sucker. Okay, that tenants be license to butcher. <laughs> when I wrote my lease agreement, there are a couple of clauses in there that I know would not stand up in court. The reason I do this is because my goal is to never go to court. In the somebody reminded me, I've been at it for eight years now. Um, I've been to the LTV once in eight years. I have 81 tenants <coughs> right now, seven buildings. So everything I've ever done, my goal is always to stay out of the LTV and to get an N11. You know what, you guys know what that, <coughs> that, that is the form that you use to mutually agree to terminate your tenancy between a, a landlord and a tenant. So my goal is always to try and get them to agree to the N11. Uh, and this, <clears throat> my belief, which I believe stands, is that the uh, tenants will argue until they're blue in the face if you tell them that what you're doing is wrong or that here's the link for the legislation, they'll argue with you forever. But if it's in the lease agreement, they usually stand down because they know that they're responsible for whatever they sign. All right? That's the psychology behind it. It seems to work. All righty, let's get to it. I teach a course on being a landlord. One of the clauses I have is it's not just lease that I want to be part of the agreement. I also want the application. Because if they've lied on the application, oh, forgive me, if they misrepresented some information or forgot something or said they didn't have a cat, when they did have a cat or they lived at this address or whatever, I want that to be part of the agreement so that if I can prove that they lied on the application, it's a breach of the agreement itself. Right? You want to list all the people who are living in the, in the building, uh, in that unit. There's no space in the, in the uh, standard lease for that. Uh, the reason I want to know, why? Why would I want to know? To speak up. This is an interactive session, and we only go have back. an hour. Go back and ask. No. Um, Sorry. Go back and ask. Well, no, no. I want. I want to know who's living in the when the yeah. Yeah. people who sign up. I want to know the names of their kids. And I want to know their dependents. Right. I want to know if their grandmother is going to live with them. Why? In case of fire. Enter. Speak up. In case of fire. That's one. You want to know because the fire department in the fire plan wants to know if there are any people who are incapacitated, bedridden, children. They want to do a, I was going to say body count, but that's the wrong word. They want to do a people count when they all assemble in the common area. And the other reason is your utilities. They might say two yeah. people and then there's six people. Mm -hmm. And if you're paying for electricity, for example. Is yep. that legal to ask those questions under the Privacy Act then? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If they're living in there, yeah, you're talking about Pepita. We'll get to Pepita uh, momentarily. The tenant dies. That agreement could fall into their estate. Now, if you've got a tenant like I have, who's paying $434 a month, for a bachelor where I know in the building literally next door I'm getting 900 but that person passed away the son-in-law or the son or whoever could move in and take over that lease and it happens so I have a clause in that that says 30 days after it reverts back to me and then you don't have that problem anymore <coughs> I break out parking separately. Why would I do that? 
cars. Every tenant thinks they get a free parking spot, right? Mm -hmm. And if they don't use the parking spot, what are they going to do with it? Rent it, rent it out. Why should they get that money? Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't they? Right? What if you've got two tenants? Uh, what if you've got one tenant, but they're uh, two working parents, for example? You don't, you don't have enough parking spots. 11 unit property with 11 parking spots. And you have another tenant who's got no parking at all. Well, I want to be able to allocate it. And that's why my parking spots are not numbered one, two, three, four, they're numbered A, B, C, D. So that there can be no association while you know one gets a parking spot one. You know, there's none of that. And although now, are there any lawyers here? <laughs> Alright, so I'm gonna speak frankly. <coughs> well you Chris, you are being recorded. Good. <laughs> All right, so I deny anything I'm saying I the temporary lapse. I have a separate rental agreement for my parking spot because the Residential Tenancies Act may or may not apply to that parking. And it's sort of a gray area. But this last year, I got $3,000 in charges for salt. Who's paying for that? The tenant should be paying for it. How do you get that if you only get a 1.8% increase? Is that salt or assault? Just salt. <laughs> no, salt. And the first three letters apply too. <laughs> Depending on who you're talking to, right? So I have a separate parking agreement and I'll raise that by five dollars. Five dollars on thirty-five dollars is what? Fifteen percent? Not one point eight percent. Someday somebody may challenge me on that and then I'll go to court and we'll find out. But for now, everybody's paying. Helps me cover uh, some of my costs. You need to understand that the LTD can only adjudicate over current tenants. So if a tenant leaves and they've done damage to your unit, you can't go to the LTD to collect that money. Where do you go? Yeah. After you got a judgment from the LTD. All right. If they haven't paid the rent or any other things that are usually associated with that. So the other thing about the LTV and this particular clause is that you cannot put your guarantor in the lease agreement. If you do that, it's invalid. Why? They're not renting. They're not tenants. Guarantors are not tenants. And there's already case law. So you have to have a separate guarantor agreement. And I've got a separate, you know, two-pager. And then you make the lease agreement an addendum to your uh, guarantor agreement. And the process would be, and no guarantor knows this, and I do not educate them, and I'll tell you, that's my number three defense. I've had more guarantors resolve conflict between me and a tenant. Guarantors my, are, are my favorite backup money, especially with <coughs> younger tenants. So the process would be uh, the tenant has not paid the rent for a couple months. You've gone to the LTV. You've got a judgment. Once you get the judgment that says that the tenant has not paid the rent, then you can take that judgment along with the lease agreement and your separate guarantor agreement to small claims court and start the process over again and sue the guarantor. You know, the reality is you'll never do it, but I've never had to. Because the guarantors don't know that, they think that they're on the hook, and they're going to immediately try and resolve the problem. But it's got to be a separate agreement. <coughs> the clauses that you put in, are, is there going to be a copy of them, or should we? Not, a, not the clauses themselves. I'll give you a copy of the presentation. Okay. Right? You can give that to your lawyer and say, here, write this up, or you can go to standardz.ca and buy them from me. Right. It's $140. I spent months and I've had this vetted by multiple lawyers. Right. Have these 84 clauses you're talking about, have they been Seven. approved by the Landlord of the Tenants Act or anybody? Or well, that's what I was saying before. Yes, well, when you say approved, no. no. Okay. But because I put some clauses in there that I know won't win. One of them is no pets. Well, you know that a no pet clause is not valid. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to get to that, but since we're on that subject, it's not against the law to turn down a tenant because they have a pet. Now, if I got $100 every time a tenant said, I don't have a pet. I have a pet. No, if I got $100 every time I said I have a pet and you can't discriminate, and I'm going to say, 
What discrimination? Pet owners are not protected by the Human Rights Code. Right? There, there is no discrimination. There is a single sentence in the Residential Tenancy Act. It's literally one sentence. <coughs> pardon me, one sentence, and all it says is that a no pet clause in the agreement is not enforceable. Translated, you can't kick someone out because they brought in a pet. But you can turn them down. You can have a no pet building if you want. You can put in your advertising, no pets. If a tenant says, why did you turn me down? I never tell them. It's our policy not to tell you. We don't provide it and you don't have to by law. The best answer you can give is, I'm not telling you. It's the safest answer because you're setting yourself up for any number of human rights, Privacy Act, Residential Tenancies Act, uh, PAPITA, and a couple of others. Chris, on that note, uh, there's, a, a, there's, a, there's lots of experienced landlords in here, but for the non-experienced landlords, you know, something as simple as we had multiple applications, we decided to go with another tenant. That's all you got to say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we've got someone else in, uh, qualified, or if you want. If you feel compelled to give them an answer, that's, that would be the safest answer. I have a couple, just I think, basic questions to me and maybe to others. First of all, is this um, the new residential um, lease that the government's prepared, or whoever it is, apply to all properties, single family rentals, multi family uh, units, uh, duplexes? And what about the person who doesn't have a lease? Do they have to have a lease now, or can they be month to month? All right, well, lease? let's answer question one because I won't remember question two. <laughs> It must be used for most residential uh, units. Anything that's covered by the Residential Tenancy Act, you have to use that standard lease for. And that would be single and semi-detached houses, apartment buildings, condos, and second units, secondary units. You know, uh, in laws of each. Legal basically. or illegal? Matter. Well, the, the, the status of legal or illegal is a municipal issue with bylaw. It has nothing to do with Tennessee law. And Tennessee law is provincial. So it applies whether you're living in Tamiskamine, Balls Falls, or Toronto. Right? It's the same. And what was your second question? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, month to month. Month month. Oh yeah. They have to now so we? so uh, it's actually not a standard lease agreement. It's a standard rental agreement. Uh, and the only difference between a rental agreement and a lease agreement is that a lease agreement has an end date. Everything else is exactly the same. And the law in Ontario says that once the lease agreement ends, it automatically becomes month to month. You can't say your lease is over. Get out. Can a commercial? You cannot in Ontario residential. Other provinces you may, but not here. Okay? Does that answer the question? So it's month to month. So if you have tenants that have been with you for like four years and yep. obviously they signed a, a lease agreement four years ago on the custom date one that you had, um, and now you're having issues with them, do they have to abide by the new lease or do they no. abide by the previous one? They, it, it's the grandfather lease. Okay, so they do the yeah, grandfather they, Yeah, okay, awesome. and uh, when I bought properties, I'll get a one-page lease agreement with 12 clauses on it that I have to live with, you know, right. because those tenants have been longer, been there longer than I've owned the property, yeah. uh, which sucks. Yeah. My, my lease agreement before the lease came out was 11 pages. Now it's, uh, I've got nine pages of clauses on top of the standard. Yep. What if, what if they signed it? So they, I bought the property. No. Well, you can ask, and if they agree, then anything that's agreed to in writing is fine. But you can't compel them. Yeah. You can't enforce rent collections, <coughs> rent arrears. So you've won your court case. Now what? In the superior courts, you can get the courts and the police to collect that money. In the family courts, you can get the deadbeat spouse 
You notice I didn't say man or woman. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You can get the kids to be spiced to pay for the uh, to pay their uh, child uh, what's it called support. Child support. All right. But there's no facilities in small claims court or the LTV to collect. Once you win, you still have to go and find the people. You have to serve them. You have to uh, get them to court. You have to get a judgment. And then, when all that's done, you still have to collect. And how are you going to do that? Especially if they got no money. Don't waste your time with the SCC or the LTV. Resolve it on your own. Now you'll notice, <coughs> I have a little, uh, little table here that says what's included and what's not included. Now on that one it says that uh, hot water is not included. How, how is that possible? Do you pay the hot water? Say again? Do you pay the hot water fee? Well, most, people, most landlords pay the hot water, right? They have a hot water tank and uh, they're hooked up to gas or to electric. And, well, it's uh, a separate meter, you know? Separate meters, so you that's the answer, right? I have a hot water tank in every unit and it's hooked up to their panel. Oh, their you grow four marijuana plants, <laughs> just four, it will cost $600 a year in electricity in Oshawa, between wow. 600 and 800. Right? If electricity is included in the rent, you're going to get massacred. So, my goal is a triple net lease in residential. That's my end goal right now. Does anybody do any commercial here? Do you know what a triple net lease is? So TMI is separate. You've got basic unit rent, and you've got taxes, maintenance, and insurance. I'm trying to get my tenants to pay all of their own utilities, and uh, eventually, maybe I'll even show them the property tax bill and the building insurance bill and just prorate it. And I don't know if I'll get that far, but that's, that's what I'm working on. <coughs> I have a clause in there, in the sweet metering, that says, I'm not sweet metering today, but one day I might. The day that I do that, you have to convert. And I've done that successfully, multiple times. Of course, when you do that, you have to give them a, if you've got uh, utilities on Utilities. You have to give them a, a rebate? New tenants only. The old tenants will never do it. I've never had one tenant ever do it. Yeah. And yes, you would have to give them a rebate. It's a long form, and it's a waste of time. Just for clarity, so you've got a new tenant coming into your building. Yep. It's twelve hundred bucks a month. Uh, yep. Utilities included. Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. You, you just said the metering. You may have metering. If I if I have a bulk that. meter, then yes, the the utilities would be included. Electricity, yeah. for example. Yeah, exactly. But I plan to convert at some point then as soon as I do that, they will take over the meter. And do you have to, to give them a discount? Yes, yeah. I have a, the clause calculates okay. that. Thank There's you a thank formula you. in the clause. Okay. Yeah. It basically says whatever the bill is over the year divided by 12 will be the average, and that's why I'll reduce the rent by. Okay. Right. Which is also what the RTA says, more or less. Uh, LMR stands for? Last month's rent. Boy, you guys are going to be this proactive. <laughs> Last month's rent. Grab you by the earlobes. The law is very specific, and it says at the end of the year you have to give a rent. Uh, you have to give interest on their last month's rent, and that interest is equal to whatever the guideline increase was. So this year is 1.8 percent. You have to give an increase. Uh, Rebate. Interest of 1.8 percent on that rent, which means you have to write 81 checks if you've got 81 tenants. Right? The law is silent on the fact that you can top up the rent, right? And you can do it. What that means is that when you do your rent increase, then you would ask them to add the increase for last month's rent, so that you're always current. You've got someone who moved in. 15 years ago, and they have $700, you know, as their last month's rent. And then when they move out this year at $1,200, you've been stiffed for 500, 500 bucks. But if you increase it every month, I'm uh, sorry, every year, then it should be current with what they're paying now. However, it never works like that. 
So I have a clause, and I also put it into my introductory letter that says we will not ask you for a top up, and we will not pay you the interest because it's a wash. The top up is going to be 1.8 percent. The interest that you pay is 1.8 percent. So the idea is that there's no admin fee. So when they move out, yes, they're going to pay 700 bucks, but you didn't pay the interest for 15 years on that money either. All right? But you've got to have it in writing. If you don't have it in writing, they will get their interest and you will not get your top up. So make sure there's a clause like that. The other benefit is that when you sell a property, the buyer automatically gets that uh, interest added on that LMR. If you show the buyer's lawyer that you have a clause that says we will not be collecting, then they don't get that top up. And that could be, oh geez, a grand or more. Dinner for two at the cake. <laughs> for four. Do the credit check. Do the credit check. It is really, really important. I've had guarantors whose credit rating is worse than the person who was applying. Right? Rent check, I use, and because we're members of an association, it only costs us $15 for, the, uh, for each check, for each uh, credit check. Weeds out some tenants. I've had tenants, after they get the, the nine pages of clauses, and I ask for a rent, uh, uh, for a credit check, I never see them again. No. Perfect. Right? Aye. Uh -huh. right. Now, here's a new one. I only learned this last year. I had a um, officer from the Privacy Commissioner, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner, come in and do a presentation. And we learned a few things. My number one defense when I go and do references is to call the last two landlords, right? And when you call the last landlord, what are they going to say? Great. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Because? <laughs> well, finally I get a response. All right. I found some comfort. Yeah. yeah. We're going to get screwed. Yeah. The second last landlord is going to tell you the truth because they want to get even. Right? Or they really do feel that the tenant, whatever it is, you're going to get a much more true. Uh, response. The problem is that you can't do that. Papita says, yes? What wording do you use then when you need to, um, when you get the call from a previous landlord? Yeah. And um, you don't and have how to do say you, how do you deal with that? terrible, but I'm sorry. And how do you deal with that? Uh, I crinkle a piece of paper in the phone and say, we've got a really bad connection. <laughs> I have to call you back. I have a better answer for you. Right? Because of this, uh, Pepita says you cannot shame a tenant. That's the wording on their website. You can't shame them. So even though they deserve everything that you want to say, you can't say it without their permission. So in your application form, make sure that it says, I have the right to go and call your previous, any references that you provided, including your last two landlords, and that is what you, when you receive that phone call, you're at risk, not the person who's calling you, right? The person who's calling you is asking for information. If you provide it, then you're the one that's shaming the tenant. So you need to ask that person, do you have written permission to call me? Send me a fax or an email, show me that you've got permission, then I'll happily tell you whatever you need to know. And I can guarantee to you, how many people here knew that? No one. You don't know what you don't know. And that's one. And here's the other one. Almost everyone believes, I believe that almost everyone believes, that you cannot take photographs inside a person's unit. So what do you do when you know that that person's got 25 cannabis plants in his bedroom and you can't take pictures of them? 
So what happens is if you do take pictures, you'll win your court case, and they'll slap you with a human rights, or not human rights, uh, privacy legislation. And they'll take you to tribunal. Well, it turns out that's not the case. There's a section seven in the PAPITA, which is the Personal Information Protection Electronic Documents Act, and you'll be tested on that later. <laughs> so you better remember. And that section seven allows you to take those pictures if you believe reasonably, you had reasonable grounds that they were breaching their agreement, or worse, committing a criminal act, right? You can do that. Oh, somebody sneezing back there? I think I got the, I got the what, what about videos? videos? What about videos? Same thing, photograph or video. You try to take only pictures of the offending <coughs> object. Don't take pictures of all their family photographs and the stuff that's on the walls. And so, so what you're saying is as a realtor, if we list the property that's rented that we better not be taking some interior pictures without the I'm, I'm saying get legal advice before you do it, but be aware that you can. You can do it. But you can't take pictures of everything. You know, all of their furniture and their and, and especially anything that's got pictures of themselves with family members. Right? Uh, here's another thing that you're going to get. I don't know if you get caught, but there's a potential for it. But Peter says, I could spend all day just talking about these guys, but it's really important. You would think that you could go online because anything that's online is public information. So they say they don't have a pet. My first port of call is Facebook, right? Well, you can't do that. Well, Peter says that that information is there in the public as a specific occurrence, as a specific piece of information. When you start putting those pieces of information together, you're creating a profile. And Peter says you're breaching privacy once you do that. So make sure your clause says, I can go online into the social webs and collect that information. Peter also says, when you don't need that information anymore, you gotta delete it. Well, when don't you need the information anymore? Most of the time when the application's over. Well, what if you need that information to enforce collection of the rent two years from now? Make sure your clause says that, that I'm gonna keep this information until a year after the tenancy is over, or something like that. But make sure you can also defend the information that you're holding on to. You thought this was easy, right? You all got, want to be a landlord, right? <laughs> Chris, just for clarity on the first part of the FIPA, where you said get, get them to sign where they, you've got permission to go back and follow uh, the landlord to ask for references. And uh, Kathy's uh, question is, and somebody, so you have that paper signed? Yep. Uh, Cass, uh, uh, the, the so I call her and ask her for a reference. Can she like spill the beans then? No. Okay, so she still can. She needs to get that information from me so that she can spill the beans. No, but you called her for a reference. Of the oh, beans. sorry. Yes. You've got the sign. Uh, so I've got the sign document. Yes. She should be asking me for a copy of that or. And so then she it. got it. Can she say the guy yes. you know did this or that? And yes. Spill the beans. At that point, it's fine because she got. Okay. You've got written permission. Based on all these things, are you allowed to ask a prospective tenant in the application to uh, supply you a criminal background check? Yes, please? but that I would you? never ask. I do it myself. Yeah. But that's legal to do that. Absolutely. You can. I have a number of phrases when I teach the course. One of them is, pick your poison. There's no right answer. Uh, a second one is, whoever holds the keys holds the power. So as long as you've got the keys, you can ask for bank statements, you can ask for a driver's license, you can ask for passports, you can ask for uh, uh, payroll stubs, you can ask for uh, an employment contract. Maybe they're new to the, to the city and you're the first person that you know is going to rent to them. You want to know that they've got a job. So you can, you can ask for all of those things. Nothing, uh, as long as it's reasonable and it's pertinent to the application, you cannot ask for a marriage certificate, for example, when you're married. It's not your business, right? You can't ask for 
proof that you belong to a particular church. Anything to do with the human rights school, right? But anything related to financial, absolutely. But the police check should be, if they're coming from Toronto to run an apartment from the UNC and funeral, the criminal check should come from the Toronto police? Because well, you they, would, is it interchange now? But I would not the ask them to do it, because yes. Photoshop is easy. Have them supply. Right? It's easy to change anything. I can change a, a 6 to an 8 on my credit report, you know, easy. So, so I would not. residents would have to be in Lindsay, that big building they have over there. I just go and get a, a criminal check uh, from Red Check. They offer the criminal checks and they offer the uh, credit checks, right? Criminal checks are expensive though, they're about 50 bucks, right? It's not expensive if you're doing it once a year. I highly recommend it if you're buying, you know, if you're going to rent out the only house that you own uh, to somebody. But if you own 81 units, you know, I'm doing that twice a month. So I don't do it. Um, Another question back here. Okay. When you're sure. collecting all that confidential information, passwords, etc., is there any sort of storage requirement that you have to follow? Any kind of what? Requirement? Storage requirement? Protection oh, yeah. of that information? Yeah, yeah. Good? And if I followed it, I'd go bankrupt. <laughs> but yes. It has to be under lock and key. There has to be physical. The physical files have to be under lock and key. You have to have a security policy. Uh, you have to have uh, a firewall. You have to have passwords. That's what Pavia says. Do I do it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm aware. This is a related somebody in our office here. So if a tenant moves out and they leave you all the goods behind, how long are you supposed to hold that? So, uh, so a tenant moved out. How do you know that they moved out? They left the door unlocked. They left the door unlocked. That doesn't. That doesn't. They notified you in writing. That they're leaving. They said, hey, Sam, I just moved out. What did they do? Okay. I've left the keys on the counter. Did they do that? with an email or a proper form? Email or text message. All right, so an email or text message is not admissible in a court of law. Uh, the only two things that are admissible is an N9, which a tenant would say, I'm moving out. In all the years that I've been doing this, I've gotten one N9. And that's the, that's the day that I learned that there was such a thing. <laughs> I didn't even know before that. Uh, I always accept uh, notification by email I won't do it by text but I accept by email but it is a risk and what I'll what I do now is I say okay great uh, please sign this n11 now the purpose of an n11 is so that if they don't move out you don't have to go to the LTB to try and evict them they're now overholding it's called same as commercial they're staying beyond the time that they said that they would and you can take that, get it stamped by the LT, stamped by the LTV, then take it uh, to a sheriff's office, and immediately they will initiate an eviction. So you can bypass the, the you know, the license to butcher process so or bleed in this case. Somebody gives you 60 days notice. Yep. You once they emailed you or called you to say, hey, I'm moving out. My last day is, you know, X Y Z. You can get them to sign and allow yep. every time. Yep. Yep. I still do that. Most cases, the tenants don't give me 60 days. They give me 30 days. And I remind them that they're supposed to give me 60. What are the chances I'm going to get that extra month? All right, so I'm not going to get the money. I'm not going to get the extra month. They'll just say, well, I won't tell you what they say. They'll say sayonara. <laughs> and uh, so you're left with nothing. So what I'll do is I'll turn that last month to my advantage. And in the N11, I'll ask them, or I'll tell them, you know you're required by law to provide 60 days. However, I will let you off the hook if you sign this N11 that says you will wash the uh, sinks, the bathtub, clean the stove, clean the fridge. Oh, God. Don't leave any. I, I put this into the N11, and they sign it. Always. They always do it because for them, it's about the money. Their time, they're willing to trade off. The money, they're not willing to trade off. So I'll say, don't leave any furniture behind, don't leave any garbage behind, and clean the unit. If you do that, then we'll call it even. 
and they sign. And I can give you 50 examples, well, at least 20 examples of that. I'll tell so, them, okay, you, I'll give you, I'll say, I'll let you out early, but only if I can get another tenant there. So I need the place to look spick and span, and I need easy access to yep. it. I'm going to give you a few open houses on this place, and this minute I can get somebody in for that date, then I'm going to give you back your last one's right. And they yeah. always do that. Yep. So, and, yeah. and I've done that too, but sometimes it backfires. I've had it backfire where you know they say yes, 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 and then they do nothing. But I still have to pay 500 bucks to clean up that place. Right, when they move out. Oh, so someone's okay. got to go in there and do Always. whatever needs to be done. And that does not include painting. Right? That's just vacuuming, maybe uh, steam cleaning the carpet, you know, patching up the old rules and stuff like that. So that's another option. You could say, uh, there, uh, if I can find somebody else, I'll rebate you whatever the difference is. And with vacancy so low, there's a good chance that that could happen. So pick your poison, right? What works for you? Or do both. Okay, do both. 85% uh, of all the purpose-built apartment buildings in Ontario were built before 1980. 85%. Which means that was during the time when there was no building code. The building code came out in 1972. It was adopted by most municipalities by around 75 to 77. So all of these old buildings have brick, two inches of um, styrofoam, wire mesh, and plaster. Perfect recipe for condensation. So the old buildings get condensation. And every year, water starts to drip down. What happens is the warm, moist air goes to the top. It hits the, uh, what do you call the beams that go over? rafters and the trusses and they'll travel down the side and they'll come back into the wall. Now if you've got um, high winds, the wind will blow through the brick and it evaporates quickly. But three or four years ago when we had that ice storm, it went into the walls and froze so quickly that it blew the brick apart. Spot, wow. right? And we had some incredible spalling damage, we had water damage and we had ice damming damage. It was significant. Water is now the number one claim. It exceeds fire on insurance. And uh, uh, some insurance companies won't even insure multi res buildings anymore. So I've got a clause in there that says, you have to use the fan that I gave you for the kitchen. Use the fan that's in the bathroom. If you see water on the windowsill, don't call me. Wipe the fan on. Wipe it down. Or turn a fan on. Oh, you don't, you don't want to use a towel? Get a humidifier. Oh, you don't want to pay for the electricity? Don't move in. <laughs> right? I, I'm, I'm emphasizing for effect. I don't talk this way yeah. to tenants. But, you know, I'm giving you what I'm thinking, not what I'm saying. Right? <laughs> so you want, you want to make sure that they will take reasonable effort to reduce the condensation. Because condensation leads to mold, oh, yeah. and mold you're responsible for. <clears throat> now, I've had a tenant who air dried her laundry because she didn't want to use the coin mop dryer. And the mold developed, just like it was, we knew it would. And she called the bylaw people when I said, no, I'm not fixing it. So the bylaw people came in and said, you're fixing it. So I wrote her back and said, I will be fixing this, and I'll be sending you the bill. You can't do that. Oh, yes, I can. I'm going to be uh, charging you under uh, a section, sorry, a uh, notice N5, which is damage to the unit. Could you deliberately damage this unit? I told you that this would happen. It did happen. You knew about it. I can bring in an expert that will, that will swear before the court that you did it. So she moved out. <laughs> Just enough to have happened. So we talked about this, you need explicit permission for a power to reach. And uh, well, whatever. This is a critical clause that is not in the SLA. And if you don't do anything else, you've got to do this. Joint to several. Several does not mean more than one. It means to sever. Right? So you will often have one or two or three people 
Okay. You tell me when my time's up, okay? You're doing great, buddy. All right. Thanks. Is that for me? Yes, it is. Thank you. This is a critical clause. When a tenant moves in, they may say, well, my partner is paying 600 and I'm paying 600. Here's my 600. No, that's not the way it works. You both owe me $1,200 any way you want to split it. But if you can't come up with 600, then your partner has to come up with 600. And that's what it means. And it's not just for this type of agreement, it's for almost any kind of agreement. Every bank account that you have with your spouse or you know friend or whatever, partner, will always be joined separately. Which means if you know if the bank account owes money, you're both responsible for the full amount. And you need that clause here as well. And it served me uh, a few times where I've had a tenant move out and the other one says, well, I'm only paying for half. So no, you know, you have to pay for all of it. Right of quiet enjoyment. This is the underlying tenant, the underlying principle of the Residential Tenancies Act. And it's a misnomer. It's mislabeled. It should be the right of peaceful enjoyment. Well, I don't know where they came up with the word quiet. Maybe one, at one time it was just about noise. But not just about noise. Uh, abusive language, swearing, death threats, uh, smells. Right? So if somebody routinely burns fish, well, I can tell you that badly burned fish smells like a decaying corpse. It is absolutely horrific. Once, sure. Once a week, no. Right? Uh, this also brings up the issue of cannabis. They're smoking that heavy smell. And you can go after the tenant that's violating the right of quiet enjoyment of all the other tenants, as long as the other tenants complain. Now, if none of the tenants are willing to stand up and complain, my answer to them is, I don't live there. It's your home. If you're not going to stand up for it, there's nothing I can do. So I'll get an affidavit. They don't have to come to court. I'll even pay for it. It's 25 bucks. I'll write it up and say, on such and such a day, we we smelled such, you know, the, the, the smell coming from this unit, and I swear to this. And they'll go to a uh, notary public or a lawyer uh, who will, you know, they'll sign it and they'll stamp it, and then you can submit that as evidence in court. The offending, uh, the offending party does not necessarily need to know who the offended party is, correct? When they get to court, they do. But it never gets that far. You're, you're entitled to know who's accusing you, right? The basic <coughs> law. Uh, but they won't know until you get to court. And it usually doesn't ever go that far. Liquids, gases, vapor, solids, you know, bad burritos. Nobody got that? Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's Unusual or dangerous hobbies. I uh, bought one building and they were grazing snakes and rats. And it, it was all self-contained, all security tanks. And I said, uh, no. And they moved. Pets, we talked about. You can go to the LTV website. Can a landlord refuse to rent a person who has a pet? Right on the LTV, web LTV website, it says, yes, you can refuse. All right? And you can send that if you ever feel the the need to justify yourself. Sorry, Chris. Yes. Um, one question. Back going back to kind one of the question. Pet. Okay, that's all you got. Going back to the pets, I had a single family home. Uh, a couple moved in. Found out that he started uh, an aquarium business. A little louder, Charles. Aquarium. So I'll fish. For you. So the whole house was full of fish tanks. Like oh, full of fish tanks. Okay, fish tanks. Yeah. Oh, fish tanks. Yeah. Yeah. So I called the city. The city said they couldn't do anything about it because uh, it wasn't. Sounds fishy. Yeah, it, wasn't, it wasn't bothering anyone else. And, well, uh, there's no bylaw against a whole room full of fish tanks. So you might have to find some other way. Right? Okay. Is there anything in your insurance that would risk the building? Flooding. Because of floods. Do they have. Uh, enough insurance yes. of uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, personal tenant insurance, insurance right? right. Uh, do they have that? If they don't have it, then you can say, you're, you, 
it's a risk to the property, right? Okay. Uh, are they consuming more utilities because of all the electricity that they're consuming? They paid their own utilities. Yeah. So oh, so they paid their own. Yeah. But yes, I mean, technically, there isn't much you can do. If they're growing piranha, you might have an argument. Right, well, you could say right. so goldfish, probably not. Goldfish, right? Take it out of the tank, though. Your sandals. If they're on the on the main floor, if they're on the main floor, it could be a structural issue. Sorry. Maybe I missed this. Um, if you've got a tenant that's not responsible for their dog's crown. Are you able to? A, a tenant who's not responsible for dogs crap. Crap. But the dogs, you mean they're not acting responsibly? Yeah, they're not picking up or they're digging right. up your front yard. So you take a photograph and you call the bylaw people and you call the health department. Thank you. Right. There is a company called Poo Prints. Poo Prints? Oh my God. Yeah. And they're trying to find a way to create legislation that will force tenants to uh, submit their dogs to uh, poop to a DNA test, oh. uh, then it becomes a registry, and yes. you can you can uh, you know, find out who the dog it is, and then you've got incontrovertible evidence, right? You can take the dog. And I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is supposed to be for domesticated animals, but you know, it could apply to spouses. <laughs> Right. Speaking of animals, you have a clause that covers someone moving into a unit of yours, bringing with them their own pet uh, bed bugs. Uh, yes, I do. Oh, oh, yeah, I do. Uh, they, it's tougher to enforce. But I have a clause that says, if I can prove that the source of the infestation, whatever it is, it could be rats. If I can prove that the source of the infestation, and I would bring in an expert uh, pet or um, pest. It's interesting how P-E-T-S and P-E-S-T are. So close so far away. I'm so far apart, yeah. Um, if I can prove that it came from them, then they're paying everything. And I would claim that under damage to the unit, not in a assuming they can afford to pay the damages. Well, they can't. Other but maybe you'll get rid of them. I understand other tenants have the right immediately to move out, breaking leases and analysis. I don't know that that's true. Yeah, that's happened. I, I, know bucks, yeah. I, I don't know that that's. I don't know that that's written in the law. Landlord. There may be uh, um, common law or precedents set in the LTB that says when that happens. If someone's going to go as far as to make a claim at the LTB, then they'll probably win. But I don't think I've read anything that says you that you have the document. So I have a clause in the And knock on wood. Knock on wood, I've not had any test problems yet. Not once. People in this room that are common in this city. Yeah. Well, I'm not talking about clients. I'm talking about you know the little critters, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, but that's that's the way I've handled it. Chris, back to the pipeta and the, yep. back to the dog and the poo poo on the lawn. And are you allowed to take a picture of the dog doing their thing? Absolutely. Grab evidence of the dog. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, that's why you install video surveillance. <laughs> Just remember, when you install video surveillance, that'd be a good job for someone. <laughs> yeah, I have an opening for a TA. <laughs> TA means? <laughs> Tenant assessment. <laughs> <laughs> so let me give you one little example from a financial perspective. You make up a lot of your terms, aren't you? <laughs> Let me give you one example from a financial perspective. I've got uh, uh, my favorite tenant, type of tenant, demographic tenant, would be a senior citizen. They don't argue, they don't complain, they always pay on time. Maybe they want to talk to you more than you want to talk to them, but that's not a bad thing. But they're fatally flawed. When they move in, when are they moving out? When they die. Yeah. 
they're only moving out one of two ways, in a wheelchair or in a box, right? So they moved in. I'm sorry if I'm too graphic. No, I'm not sorry, but I am graphic. So, so they moved in, they're paying $1,000 a month this year. 10 years from now, because of rent controls, they're paying 1200 but the going market rate is 1500 That $300 times 12, because there's no cost associated with that, right? There's no expense of any kind, is $3,600. Now, the direct capitalization method that's used by MPAC, by CMHC, by you know, everyone, says that you divide that net operating income by the cap rate. Let's say it's 5% to keep it easy. 5% of $3,600 is $72,000 of equity that you don't have because you've got a senior. And if you've got a building full of seniors, say 10, that's three quarters of a million dollars. So it's against the law and the human rights code to discriminate against seniors. But I just want to point out, all things being equal, you're going to have a pecking order. And while seniors used to be at the top of the list, the Residential Tenancies Act and rent controls put me in a socially compromised position of having to choose between my livelihood 10 years from now and my social responsibilities in the community. Yeah, that, and knowing all of those numerical points of valuation. Serious about it, the uh, 100 units like Andy, for example, might be worth 10 fees to say, please move. Buy them up. To me, oh, yeah, to buy them out if you can. I've offered that tenant to who's paying 434 I offered her $6,000. Her response was, Where am I going to move to? And she's right. Speaking on behalf of a lot of seniors in this room, that's discrimination. <laughs> I was the first to admit it. And I'm not saying I do it. I'm just saying you should be aware as part of your business case. You probably get 20 grand to move you up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll up at the 25. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm officially out of time, but you tell me I, I'm, I'm here for the day. Uh, you guys uh, want to keep going here in terms of that? Yeah. Everybody, uh, for those that want to depart, uh, I'm only at 46. Some will be offended, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> keep going. Right. If you have a, a name that's going to apply to people that any age, you know, like you're going to have a tenant that is younger or older, and they're high school employees keeping up with their facilities. Yep. Rent is always paid on time. You've never had any issues with that. Um, but getting letters from the utility companies and things like that and they're behind you've given them the opportunity to try and why and are you getting up. the letters if they're paying the bills well locally here the water and sewer and uh, water water and sewer yeah um, and then i've asked them behind our utilities as well you can't disclose how much but they are are you using why can't it? they disclose if you're responsible for paying the bill you're only responsible here for paying the water and sewer but the electricity oh. would follow them we wouldn't sure. be billed for the electricity right. so you shouldn't get a letter from no, we don't. Electricity. We okay. only get it for water and sewer. Yeah. I'm just picking their brains yeah. along the phone okay. to have an idea of how much okay. they're behind. Uh, and what form and what's the process can you give to a tenant if they're behind on the water and sewer that now is is, is the water included issue? in the rent? No, it's their responsibility. Okay, so it's not included in the rent, but they're responsible to pay it. Yeah. Well, the law says that the homeowner has to pay that. So the only recourse that you've got is that they don't pay the bill, you have to sue them, the tenant. So you can't give them like an N5 or an N4 for unpaid utilities? No. Nope. For any unpaid utilities? For any unpaid utilities, period. But they come from the list. Well, what do we do? Did you just say it's not fair? It's not fair. This is what I said, yeah. Well, uh, don't get me started. <laughs> so, small claims. Yeah, you have to go to small claims and, and because you have an agreement that says that they would pay. Now here's where it gets interesting. If the agreement is inside your rental agreement, then the LTB said, or sorry, uh, small claims court says we have no jurisdiction over rental and lease agreements. Oh. And if you go to the LTB, they say we don't we don't have any control over the utility bills. We have nothing to say about it. So it's this it's this gray area. And you would really have to go to a paralegal at that point and figure out what your strategy would be. 
basically my strategy yeah. is to tell them that I am going to destroy their credit score. I'm going to turn over this bill to a collection agency uh, along with uh, the agreement that says, now I'm only going to get two thirds back, right? The collection agency keeps yeah. one third. Which collection agency do you use? Uh, here, I'm using Pro Legal Collection Services. They're based in Oshawa. A guy's name is Robert Muncaster, M-U-N Caster. Uh, it usually doesn't go that far. I've only ever had to do that once. But I'll tell them, if you think that your credit score doesn't matter to you, wait until you try and get a phone. Oh, yeah. Wait until you try at your next place that you move into to get electricity. They're going to ask for a $300 deposit. The gas company will ask for a $300 deposit, and the water company will ask for a $300 deposit. So you will have $1,000 of your money tied up. If anyone calls me for a reference, you know what reference I'm going to give. I'm going to turn this over to the collection agency. They will call you for the next seven years because computers are really good at that. <laughs> and um, I can't remember what the other threats are. <laughs> Having said all of that, if you pay the bill, or if you move out, or if you give me the N11, which is what I really want at that point, if it's on utilities, you're going to have to make a judgment call. Yeah. But uh, if you do these things, I will not provide any reference. I'll just say it's our policy not to give one. I won't report you to the collection agency, and I won't wreck your credit score. Yeah, Let's call right. it even. You have a right to say that? Uh, yes, absolutely. It's not a threat. Oh, yes, it is a threat. Yeah, it's, it's a, that's a why I say threat. this. This will ruin your threat. credit score. I'm sorry? If you award it properly, then it's not a threat. No, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Again, I'm, this will I'm, probably I'm, end up ruining your credit score. I'm, 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 I'm speaking no very. You never will have credit. credit. Like you know, is it against the law to tell them that they can't smoke cannabis? Oh, sorry, you had your hand up. I did just want to confirm. You had talked uh, with the retiree or the retired people. What I'm understanding from you is you're not raising the rents annually because of that deposit being held. No. Oh, yes, yes. So you do I'm not raise your rents the rent annually. Because I'm not paying the interest on that rent. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. no, no. no, that's no, no. I raise the rent every year. You do. Religiously. Yes. Right? So the never really interest cost. on the last month. No, no, no. The interest I have I to know pay that, yes. on the last month's rent yes. versus the top up that I would accept on that last month's rent. So, you know, the last month, if it's gone up $18 a month, okay. then I can collect that $18 from them for the last month as well. I, I don't ask for that. Okay. And that's what's in lieu of. Okay, okay. got it. Yep. All right. So, is it legal to say, no, you can't grow cannabis plants? And the answer is still to be resolved in the courts, but I'm 90% confident that the answer is no. I'm no. oh, sorry, it is legal to say, yes. no, you cannot grow cannabis plants. Yeah. In a new lease, not an existing one. Right? In other provinces, you can actually go and modify your lease to say, no smoking means no smoking anything. And in New Brunswick, you can actually add a clause that says, no growing cannabis. You can add that. Can't do that in Ontario. Even medicinal, you can. So again. What about medicinal? Yes. So that's the issue. Medicinal. So I wrote a two-page letter, and I said there is nothing that you can tell me that justifies you having to smoke marijuana, because when you smoke it, typically it's for pain or related issues. And smoking it means it goes straight to your bloodstream, but it only lasts about 15 minutes. And the dose is not uh, measurable, right? It's not like a prescription. However, they can take an oil, a capsule, a pill, or even a patch, because it can be absorbed into the skin. And if it's done that way, it takes longer to get into the bloodstream, but it can last up to eight hours. So how can you justify to me that you need to smoke the only reason that you need to smoke is for the high. It's not for the, the hell that, PCB or where the three layers are. I think PCB is in the CBD. CBD? You don't get the medical, the medicinal benefits from smoking marijuana. 
specifically for smoking. And I believe that the law for cannabis will eventually be almost exactly the same as alcohol. You can, you can imbibe, you can have alcohol anytime you want, anywhere you want, according to the law. But we also know that there's case law that it's not a good idea to do that while you're operating heavy equipment. And I believe that that will be the same yeah. with uh, cannabis. Okay, so let's be, uh, Chris, uh, some okay. of the people who've asked before you go on, are you, will you be forwarding this entire document? I'm not forwarding it, I'll send you a link. Okay, yeah, that's right. And then they, you can download it. This okay. document. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's So right. you, you send me an email, I'll send you, I'll give you a You can send me that link, uh, Chris, and I'll, I'll disseminate that. Okay. Sure. If you want to be on the mailing list, just actually you can do that yourself just go to the, the website and there's a place to sign up do you have a clause for uh, no growing cannabis in your no 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 just in my new in, in the lease itself so you have a website that do you send out like little updates and stuff like that do you have a do you have a website for well i have a website for the articles i write i'm a regular contributor to when right. say magazine just finished writing uh, an article on fentanyl, mm -hmm. which is, by the way, a serious first responder situation. Every one of you is a potential first responder, right? You could be into a building before anybody else and find somebody that's dead yeah. or went into a meth lab or something. Mm -hmm. Fentanyl, you only need four grains the size of salt. Salt grains. Four salt grains will kill you. Four salt grains. It's a hundred times more, uh, no, more potent than heroin and 40 times more toxic. And it's it's being uh, incorporated into the uh, distributed drugs on the street. So when you smoke, if there's fentanyl in the smoke, and RCMP officers have uh, gone to uh, hospital. Uh, I think one has died. Uh, you go into a, you go into a room that's filled with the smoke. If you're in there too long, you'll get dizzy. You should. And by the way, you can get. I think it's called the Loxon. Loxon. You can get an Loxon kit. And as a realtor and as a uh, landowner, you should have one in your car. And it's free. Go to any pharmacy. Give them your driver's license and they will give you a kit. And what it does is it opens up, uh, what uh, fentanyl does is it relaxes all the muscles. Except this guy. <laughs> it relaxes all the muscles and eventually you'll suffocate. Okay? So naloxone opens up all the air passages and gives you about 20 minutes to get the hospital. To back up your comment, it was on the news today that there have been over 13 deaths since the beginning of this year at Peterborough based on fentanyl. Yeah. Wow. That the police have put out that they know of. that's 13, yeah. almost, that's almost as much as they had all last year. So when we're dealing with 9,000 in Canada. 9,000. So year. it's a real problem. Okay. And they don't know. Be careful. You, you don't even know that you, you know, until you're dead. Yeah. Then you know. <laughs> <laughs> when, when it's a little bit like that. Uh, that's that's this is just a repeat of what's in the uh, Residential Tenancies Act. Most Landlords and tenants <coughs> don't know that once you, once a tenant gives permission, or sorry, gives a notice that they're moving out, you have the right as a landlord to show up anytime oh. without advance notice oh. to give a tour. Oh, really? The law says you can do that. Now, any other time, you have to give written notice 24 hours in advance, oh. except for an emergency. But once they've given notice, you can show up. <coughs> so that's another bargaining chip that I give. When they only have 30 days, I'll say, by the way, we can show up anytime we like. Here's the link. But I will try and give you advance notice as long as you keep your place clean. Mm -hmm. Right? But you might want to use that if you suspect. What can we refer to that on the act? Just in case if they ask, can you tell me where that is? Is it on the act somewhere? We can uh, well, the right of entry is yeah. on the landlord tenant board. There'll yes. be a brochure okay. for yeah. tenants okay. that talks specifically yeah. about this okay. right of entry. Already, I know that that small language. That's why I made uh, the bold, just so I can speak to the point. Okay. What's Castle stand for? C A S L. You should all know it because you're all realtors and you're all sending out emails. 
Canadian anti-spamming legislation. And as individuals, you can be sued for up to $100,000, and as a corporation, up to a million dollars. And it has teeth. So you want to make sure you've got permission. So I've got a clause in there that says, if you put your email address in this lease, I have the right to communicate with you about it, and you can't rescind that right. So they've opted in. Now, the truth of the matter is, they probably could rescind that right if they really wanted to push it. But almost all tenants want to communicate that way anyway. Right? But you still need you still need the permission. There's the new form out too yeah. now that you can get them to sign. Yes. There's that? a form? Yes. Yeah, the landlord board put it out about a month and a half but, ago. It's oh, right okay. on their website. And it just gives you you put the property address, you put your name, your email address, yep. and then it states in there that they accept to communicate that way for notices and oh, Okay. And then I think on there it outlines that they are responsible for notifying you if they change or modify oh, okay. an email address. So, so that's good. Yeah. So there's a form this lady says that uh, uh, where you can get that permission. I have it in my lease agreement anyway. Yeah, I just included right? it as But a form is better, form. obviously. Yeah. Yeah, they know what they're signing now. So we're up to 71. That's pretty good, eh? From 48 to 71 in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're, you're talking about abandonment. That's what you were asking about. I never really did answer your question entirely. So they, so they moved out they told you that they're moving out by email. They turned over the keys and they left all their stuff. How about the person who didn't pay the rent for three months? You sold all their stuff to pay for their rent arrears, and then they show up and say, where's my stuff? Yeah. What do you think they were? Jail. That's right. Yeah. This guy said, I've been in jail for three months. I couldn't call anybody. I said, you, you couldn't call a lawyer. You couldn't call somebody to let us know. No. Well, sorry, it's not strong. So the Residential Tenancies Act has very specific rules and a process or a procedure for dealing with abandonment. It's written into there and it's very specific. Uh, every paralegal would know it, you can follow it yourself. There's always a button. But Sometimes with two T's. <laughs> right? In this particular case, it was escalated to the Superior Court. And the Superior Court said, yes, you can do that. But you cannot get rid of priceless items. <laughs> well, so my question to you is, what's priceless? Yeah, anything paid by mass. And what's priceless to one person is necessary. Pictures, photographs, fair, family heirlooms, right? They're irreplaceable. They don't mean prices as in, you know, a Ming box from the 15th century. They're right? unsaleable, too. They mean, you know, yeah. grandma's wedding ring or dress or whatever. So you take that stuff, you put it into cold storage or put it in your basement or something, somewhere safe, keep it for five or six years. <laughs> Just five or six years. The room for storage building? The, uh, <laughs> well, if they come back and they want it, then you can charge them a reasonable fee. But you'd have to show them that you spent money on that. Storage. You can't you can't say that I store it in my basement and I, I, you know, I charge $50 a month for renting yeah. my basement. Could you put that in the lease agreement that if they abandon their belongings you have to store it? Of course. You can put anything, anything into the lease agreement. Yeah. So you just have to sign it. Now, I've never, ever had a tenant come back to me and say, your lease is too tough. Oh. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sign it. What usually happens is I give them the lease and I never hear from them again. <laughs> That's perfect. I don't want to make myself so right? And I've never, ever changed one clause. Ever. Now I can do that when the vacancy rates are at 1%. Yeah. Right? When they're at 5%, I might have to rethink my business case. By then, I will sold all my property to you guys anyway. So. <laughs> Let us know when you're selling Christmas. Yeah, dump them all. Yeah, I'll do that. I'm going to buy it home. My kids are going to get my copies. Maybe. <laughs> I don't want to say you don't care about them. Um, renter's content insurance. Now, in the lease agreement, the standard lease agreement, there is actually a place now that says that you will maintain uh, renter's content insurance. I don't enforce it. I say you don't have to have it, but the very last clause, well, clause 73, near the end, it says 
You don't have to have content insurance, but understand that if you don't have it, none of your personal effects are covered mm -hmm. by the landlord's insurance. To make sure that they sign that. And uh, that's come back more than once as well. Uh, well, it was the people upstairs that uh, let the water run. Yeah, okay, so that's for the building, not for your stuff. If you got a claim, you got to go and sue them, not the landlord. We're not responsible because they left their sink on. Right? And that's it. Just the guarantor thing that we already talked about. That's not bad, an hour and 20 minutes. Usually it takes two. But of course, I have skipped over half of the classes. But I thought those were the most important. Uh, I've got a question. Um, Did you say a quick question? Quick question? Maybe no, I didn't say quick. The answer is always easy. Yeah. Um, someone parks on your parking lot when they're not authorized to yeah. park in your parking lot. Yeah. Oh. They slip and fall. Yeah. One scenario. Scenario two, they bring their car and they damage their car but back into the neighborhood fence. Yeah. Can they go off to you? Well, uh, so the question, if you didn't hear it, was uh, someone who's unauthorized has parked their vehicle and slipped and they, they want to make a claim against you, or they've damaged their car by running into your building. Can they go out? Uh, well, a free and open society says they can come after you. I think your real question is, would you be responsible? Sure, so that's where it's going to. Yeah. And, yeah. and I would say you probably still have to go through the process but you would come out as not responsible, right. which is what you would expect, right? Yeah. You would say they're trespassing, right? And if they damage their car on your wall, you would counter sue and say, you damaged my wall. Fix it, right? I've yeah. never had to do any of that. Yeah. You mentioned earlier about if you have a tenant who is growing in your unit, and you go in, they can't prove you that they have a license to do it. What is your recourse? I mean, I can't say, well, you better promote. Should you, at that point, protect your property as landlord, call cops? Well, we're allowed. They're allowed to. They're not going to go for four months. Until recently, they weren't allowed. It was against right. the law to grow a pot in your house. It's called a, a co op, right? right? But now, they legally grow so many for medicinal purposes. Four. 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 Okay. But let's say they're growing 20. Right. Okay, so now you, as a landlord, when you see that, it's now an illegal uh, That's issue. Right. Yeah. You, you get on the phone to call cops and say, I think you should get a search warrant. I have a unit here, I have a tenant that's growing for marijuana. You can, but the police probably won't do anything about it. No. I would be more inclined to just sue for damages or breach of contract. If I've got a clause that says you can't grow this stuff and you're growing it, then I pursue the uh, civil action. Because the police won't process a civil action. They only process criminal action. They don't care if someone's doing something illegal. They care, but they're overwhelmed with this stuff. You can grow four plants. No, no, that's not only, it doesn't have to be stuff. medicinal. It doesn't have to be medicinal. Or your so what you do is you have to... Well, to give you an example. To give you an example. For those who don't watch the news, a recent case in Peterborough on the Down Street with a for uh, sale sign on the front where the police raided it and took out bags of marriage, other legal stuff, two or three tenants were arrested. Yes, well that's different. That they were sale. probably growing it for the purposes of resale. Yes. Yeah. So that's you're distribution. That but so right. it's your tenant. It's your you tenant. Know what if you think that they're selling it and you've got people showing up on the property, yeah. then you can tell them, look, I'm watching you. Yeah. And I'm going to tell every tenant that walks in here, if you're buying this stuff, you're on video camera. Yeah, but this day and age, you want to make sure you have it done. Okay. Yeah. For illegal use. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but where are you going to do that revoking of that lease in the LTV? How long does it take to get a hearing right now? Three months? Two months? Three? Oh, you're like Yeah, between three and four months. And then they automatically get a 30 day stay of execution. And then if you do win, it's another 30 days before, at least before the sheriff convicts. So you're looking at between four and six months of lost rent. Because the day that you go to pursue court action, they, they stop paying. Can you just like not put a for sale sign right on it? Just 
Yeah, but the person who buys it, <laughs> can, can, right? Yeah. So you can't, and you have to disclose. If you don't disclose that you've got tenants who haven't paid back rent, it'll come back on you. Uh, a really uh, experienced landlord once told me. Yeah. <laughs> a really experienced hey, landlord that? once told me. You have a lot of bad luck, eh? You can, uh, <laughs> you can go and remove their front door off their unit to replace it. Or put it back on. <laughs> put it back on for a while. Tom, did you tell Elk that? Replace like the door. You, say. <laughs> you mean remove the door? Bring in the front door of the unit. To replace it. Well, yeah, if, I was on the other side, if I was on the other side of that fence, the number one complaint that tenants have against landlords is the changing of locks without permission. It's number one. Number two is turning off utilities. Yeah. All right. So if you remove that door, then you change the lock. Now you don't need their permission to change the lock, but you're required by law to give them keys to the new lock immediately. No, what if the door came on the wrong size? <laughs> you can't make it work. Well, it went for two or two weeks. So, so here's when we get into the gray area. Okay. I tell everyone. I tell everyone. I tell everyone. That if you do every single thing that the law requires of you, you will go bankrupt. I guarantee it. So as a consequence, you've got to make a decision. This is a slum lord. This is the perfect landlord, socialist, with all the redeeming qualities of probably the out of business in five years. And somewhere between those two is your comfort zone. And the only way you can fully establish that comfort zone is if you know what the law is. And then you talk about messing around with the door, not working. Well, sure, I can cause grief. And I have one tent right now, I call her McNutter. <laughs> so that when I talk to everybody, they all know I'm talking about the same person. And she recently uh, got upset because I increased the rent. You can't increase the rent, I'm not paying. Well, you don't pay it, I'll evict you. Sent her an in for So she calls the bylaw office, of course, <laughs> and says there's some garbage back there that's been there for a month. Bylaw off shows up the same day. <laughs> now, if I got that from the LTV, I'd be yeah. pretty damn happy. They write up an order. They call me the next day. Uh, we're going to be writing up an order. You've got to move that stuff. I said, you can't move that stuff with a jackhammer. It's rock solid. I've tried twice. That stuff we put down in January, then we got the bad snowstorm, it all got frozen solid. Did you try to move it? Oh no, we never touched this stuff. I said, you understand that the tenant is doing this because she's got her own agenda. I don't care. Those were her words. When she said those words, I went on the war path. And some of you may have gotten my email that said that I had a, uh, a situation with the bylaw. And it went from the mayor down to his uh, commissioner of corporate services who went down to the LTV manager and went down to the case officer and moved back up and I got resolved. So they removed the order, but I had to go through that process. It took me a day. She wrote the next day, oh by the way, I need my rent receipt for her taxes. The law says I have to give her a copy if she asks for it. So I waited two weeks. Because I know she wants to get the stuff done right away. So it's working her. She said, I've been asking since February. And I wrote back the day after, which is April 2nd. I knew that she was going to withhold the rent because I told her twice, you can't withhold the rent for any reason, which includes not giving your memories. I knew she was going to do it, and she did. So she now has an N4 issue against her. With a touch of evil genius, which when I gave her. Maybe you want to turn off the camera now. <laughs> All right, you can listen to it. What I did was I wrote, I made a mistake, and I dated the receipt from March 2018. Instead of March. Shut that off there, or shut that off. It's too late. It's too late. It's okay. You can edit it. What is it? I, I don't have a problem with this because. If, if I was ever called to deal with it, <laughs> for half a speech, it doesn't matter. So, 
the reason I did that is because if she submits that receipt to the CRA and the CRA finds it, they're going to ask her to get a new receipt. It's going to delay her payment. Like she made me wait eight months, you know, eight hours of my day. Uh, and then she's going to have to come back to me and it's going to take another week or so for her to get that rent receipt. And of course, she doesn't get her, her tax rebate, which she may be counting on, until she's probably filed the claim. So I'm not saying that that is an ethical, certainly not even a legal thing to do, but it's payback. And, 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 and she's the only one I've ever resorted to that kind of thing. But it's because she caused me so much grief to pursue her own agenda, to use the city as a weapon against me, I've never ever had. In all the time that I've been running this business, I've never had an order against me, except that uh, mold thing. Just by the record, that was my sister, and she's very happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your sister. <laughs> you and I have a problem. <laughs> Any other questions? So your clause about um, growing and smoking cannabis in the house, does that cover if they're cooking with it, like if they're making brownies no. in the house? No, because I don't have a problem with that. It's just smoking that causes the, the vapors that stick to the wall and turn them out. Right? So, so my clients don't cover smoking, but if it is offending other tenants, then you get the tenants and say, look, it's your place. I will pursue it, but I can't do it on my own. So I'm not the one making the complaint. You have to make the complaint. And you can do that for noise as well and for parking. If someone parks in the wrong spot, all you have to do is give the tenant their uh, piece of paper that says you have been allocated, as you see in your lease agreement, you've been allocated space B. If someone else is in space B, the tenant can call up the bylaw enforcement office and ask them to come out and ticket, and they will. Oh, you can do that? Oh, yeah. Uh, I know that for a fact from Oshawa. I don't have to as a landlord. All they require is a piece of paper from the landlord that says that they're entitled to this spot. And the lease agreement will usually suffice for that purpose. So if it's not in the lease agreement, you can write up a separate. One last question for me. One last question, and then we're going to wrap up. Just on the storage lockers or anything like that. The storage oh, yes. lockers? Do you treat them like parking spaces? No, I treat the storage lockers like a bachelor unit. <laughs> I get rid of all the storage lockers and I convert them. <laughs> Every one of them. So I deduct the, uh, I reduce the rent by 10 bucks. And then I tell them they've got three months to get rid of their stuff. No one's ever challenged me. If they did, I'd lose. But so far, I've been able to convert everyone. What are you getting for your parking space? Uh, 30 or 35 dollars, typically. Okay. Last so, question, Tamil. So, so let me finish that train of thought. Okay. So if I've got 10 storage lockers at five bucks a month each inside a building, not outside, and I'm getting 50 or 60 bucks. With a bachelor, you know, I'm getting 900. It's, it's. Uh, I mean, if I'm at, this is off the record. Are you off getting, the record? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's just <laughs> going. Okay. Are you, are you going for a minor variance to add another unit or are you just doing it? No, I just, you don't have to get a minor variance unless it specifically says that you only have five units or right. six. Okay. Uh, but you do have to get a permit. Yeah. You have to get a permit? That's what the law says. I bill it to the fire code, I bill it to the building code, and to the electrical code, and then I wait till they show up with the permit. That's what it's Because they before the horse. Because if they did come back and say, I need a permit, then I'll say, okay, what do you need me to change? And there won't be anything that they need to change. So then I just have to pay the, the fee. So yes, yeah. of course, I get a permit before I do that work. Let's say goodbye to the bank of uh, Lakefield. Uh, you can leave it. Yes, uh, Chris, um, uh, you do landlording courses. You have yep. courses that you just give us a couple of minutes on that when you spoke. Yeah, so I have a six Saturday course, it's 36 hours. Uh, $720, I think it's pretty damn cheap. If you go to Centennial, you'll be paying more than that for on that course. Uh, and I do it three times a year. I just started it last week, so yeah, it's not too late. But uh, if you miss any class, you can always take the next one. And I did bring six copies of my book, which I charged 20 bucks for, including HST. I'll even sign it. Maybe not with my own name. <laughs> uh, and uh, okay, I think that's it.
Yeah, and I run the Landlords Association for Durham Region. We meet once a month. Uh, this month, tomorrow, actually, it's the first Thursday, I'm actually going to be teaching. I'm going to be talking about the impact uh, of uh, rising cap rates and what you can do to stay ahead of the curve. If cap rate rises, equity compresses. Yeah. Right? If equity, equity compresses and you're only getting 1.8% increase, you're going to get killed. So this year, you get 2.5% interest rate. Five years from now, it's 5%. Yeah. Right? It doubled. So if it's doubled, there's no way that your income has doubled to cover that. How are you going to mm -hmm. refinance? Can uh, people uh, join, get, get on your mailing list, those yeah. kinds of things? Yeah, so I can give you my business card, send me an email, and I'll sign you up. Or you can just go to the Aztec Realty <laughs> website. A-Z-T-E-C-H. Realty. Yeah. A Z T E C H Realty dot com. Okay, and you're going to send us send me a copy of this. Uh, I'm going to send you the link, and you then we'll get that out of here. Yeah. Yeah. to you. Yeah. Just just very quickly, did you enjoy this session? Yeah. 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 Yeah, Andy, did you learn anything? I'm just curious. You're one of the largest property owners in the room. Did you pick anything out of this? Yeah, clauses, some of the clauses, definitely. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's okay. good. Alcat? Yeah, 100%. Thank okay, you. That's, that, that's great. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.